Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. The bigwigs at the United Nations wrap up their climate summit in Dubai this week, known as COP28. I've been keeping an ear on some of the coverage, and it's easy to feel a bit, I don't know, disconnected? A, from what's at stake, and B, from what I can do about climate change as just, you know, some guy who didn't get an invite to the UN summit. That's why we wanted to bring you this interview from 2019 between NPR's Rachel Martin and writer David Wallace Wells talking about his book, The Uninhabitable Earth. In the interview, he breaks down exactly what we mean when we talk about climate change, and it's worrying and scary, but then they get to talking about how do we process it all as human beings who'd prefer to just keep our heads in the sand. Here's the interview after the break. This message comes from Apple. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones, friends, or family. They can use Apple Gift Card to buy Apple products, accessories, apps, and games. But they can also use the funds to pay for music, movies, TV shows, and more. Visit Apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Author David Wallace Wells opens his new book, The Uninhabitable Earth, outlining three misunderstandings about climate change. First, it's speed. More than half of all of the fossil fuel emissions that we've ever put into the atmosphere have come in the last 25 years, which means that we've now done more damage to the climate than in all of the millennia before, in all of the centuries before. Then it's scope. We were sort of taught the problem was really about sea level and coastlines. We're starting to see that Climate change is really an all-enveloping threat, which promises to transform, probably deform, every life lived on the planet in some way. And finally, its severity. It was basically considered irresponsible to consider scenarios north of about two degrees of warming. It was called the threshold of catastrophe, and nobody really wanted to think about it. It turns out that two degrees looks basically like our floor for warming rather than our ceiling. And so we really need to start thinking about what the impacts will be at two and a half, three, and even four degrees of warming. I asked him to explain what that kind of warming would look like. The absolute worst case scenario is that the planet becomes uninhabitable. I think that that is vanishingly unlikely on any time scale that it makes sense for us to think about. But the crazy thing is, I don't think you need to look at worst case scenarios. Right. So end of the century, the UN says we're going to be at about 4.3 degrees of warming if we don't change course. 4.3 degrees of warming would mean $600 trillion in um, damages from climate impacts. $600 trillion is double all the wealth that exists in the world today. Our agriculture would probably be about half as bountiful. So the same plot of land would be producing about half as much yield in a world that we would have at least 50% more people to feed. We would have places in the world that could be dealing with six climate natural disasters simultaneously. And as soon as 2050, it's likely that many of the biggest cities in the Middle East and India will be unlivably hot in the summer. So it will be a lethal risk to set foot outside in the summer in places like Calcutta and Delhi. And UN estimates for the number of climate refugees that could be produced just by 2050, on the conservative end of their estimates, we're dealing with 100 million climate refugees by 2050. So there's a lot in there. Let's try to unpack some of what you just laid out, in, in particular, 100 million migrants as a result of climate change. How, how do you deal with that? Because that is in part where we have seen anti-immigrant populist movements explode across Europe, in the United States, when climate is driving so many people to look for sanctuary in other resource-rich countries, uh, the natural tendency is to say, yeah, maybe we need to figure out ways to keep them out or to at least save our own. Yeah, I mean, if you had to imagine a threat large enough to really call into it being a true network of global cooperation, um, climate change would be it. It's all-encompassing. It challenges the lives of everybody everywhere on the planet. And yet it's really reaching a crisis point as we're all retreating from our 
international agreements and commitments. How do these climate impacts transform the relationship between nations and the responsibilities that we feel towards one another? One quite alarming possibility is the one that we're seeing today, which is that nations recoil. Another possibility is that we will be kind of called into a kind of brotherhood, sisterhood. We realize that we're all dealing with this threat together. We all bear some responsibility for it, and we should do everything we can collectively to deal with it. But I don't think that's, you know, I don't think it's a safe bet that we'll end up in that happy place. You have laid out what do you you describe as really apocalyptic consequences. How do you deal with the human tendency to curl up in a ball and walk away from the problem? Regular people, when they hear this, they will think, how can I possibly make a difference in this? I am not a politician. I'm not a lawmaker. I'm not a scientist. So, and it is depressing to live in this headspace. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's bleak. Um, but I have to say that optimism is really always a matter of perspective. I think many of us have been taught to think about the range of possible outcomes um, for climate change as between where we are now or even zero degrees of warming and two degrees of warming. And I know that the range of possible outcomes this century is between two degrees and four degrees of warming. So how optimistic I am is based as much around four degrees of warming as it is around two. Now, two degrees is hellish enough. I think it's about our best case scenario, and it is truly alarming. Um, if we get to two degrees, one really remarkable paper demonstrated last year, the air pollution effects alone would kill an additional 150 million people beyond what the air pollution at 1.5 degrees would, would cost. That is our best case scenario. So when I talk about being optimistic, I'm talking about a range that starts at a death toll of 150 million people and extends to a world four degrees warmer where we would have eventually hundreds of feet of sea level rise, horrible impacts on agriculture and public health beyond our comprehension. Now, a lot of people would want to just sort of recoil from even that best case scenario. And yes. I think that is a human impulse. But my own instinct is to say every inch of warming makes a difference. Every inch of warming means averting some suffering or causing more suffering. And that at no point should we give up because while on the one hand, it's already too late to avert anything south of two degrees of warming, it's also never too late to change the course of our warming and make lives more prosperous and healthier and safer and more abundant and happier going forward. And so we should never, ever stop caring and never give up because it is always possible to make a difference. And I think that we will. I do not think that we'll end up at four degrees. I think it's likely we end up at about two and a half or three degrees by the end of the century. That, again, will be to any perspective that we know today, hellish. But if you know what's possible at four degrees or north of four degrees, it counts as an optimistic outcome. And that's where I am. The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, written by David Wallace-Wells. Thanks so much for talking with us. Great to be here. Thank you. All right, before we wrap up the show, we want to take a minute to say thank you so much to our new Book of the Day Plus supporters and anyone listening who donates to public media. The NPR network depends on your contributions. If you're not a supporter yet, right now is a great time to join our mission to create a more informed public. You could make a tax-deductible donation to your favorite station or stations, and you could subscribe to Book of the Day Plus and get sponsor-free listening to this show. Your donation today funds the news and podcasts that expand your horizons, connect you to exciting ideas and people, and inspire you every day. We love bringing you the Books We Love collection every year, and we want to be able to keep doing it for the years to come. So please donate today at donate.npr.org slash books or explore NPR plus at plus.npr.org. Thanks. Most people stopped using pagers decades ago. 
But in a lot of hospitals, the pager is still the way you reach doctors in an emergency. A classic thing is like, I never got the page, you know? Where were you? Never got the page. Why is it so hard for doctors to let go of their pagers? That's on the Planet Money podcast from NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from Rosetta Stone, the perfect app to achieve your language learning goals no matter how busy your schedule gets. It's designed to maximize study time with immersive 10-minute lessons and audio practice for your commute. Plus, tailor your learning plan for specific objectives like travel. This holiday season, get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off and unlimited access to 25 language courses. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from Sundance Institute. The Sundance Film Festival is coming to Utah January 18th through 28th with online screenings January 24th through 28th. Visit festival.sundance.org for information on tickets and more.